All right, guys, what is up? We are live for another installment of the Playing to Win series, number 54, and I'm joined today uh, by P.D. Mangan. How you doing, brother? I'm doing fine. Thanks, Rich. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. And um, I should I should try to frame um, who you are before we kind of like get into it and chop it up because I didn't know you until I started using Twitter on a more frequent basis. And, uh, you know, I see this... I'm not going to say older. I'm going to say more seasoned gentlemen, you know, giving <laughs> decent advice on self-care and longevity and exercise and all that sort of stuff. And you don't just talk about it, but you're one of the few guys that actually look the part. And um, let me just throw up a, I mean, like this is like one of your standard sort of um, uh, posts on your thread, but it's like, you know, hey, you know, today's workout is deadlifts, chin up rows, face pull dips. Push-ups, lateral raise, overhead press, hammer curl, shrugs, jump rope, all at one set, age 66, sun, steak, steel, and there's your, you know, jack self just, you know, improving <laughs> and giving the receipts on, you know, the work has been done sort of thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about your 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 background, like your Batman origin story, like how you got to where you are today, just to give the folks that don't really know who you are a little bit of frame? Sure. Um, so... Uh, I've been interested. So what I do now, of course, is mostly talk about health and fitness and uh, it's a topic I've been interested in a long time, at least personally. So, you know, round about when I was back in college, which was a long time ago, um, I, you know, decided I needed to get in better shape. So I did. And, uh, what was the know, catalyst? Were you a skinny out. guy? Were you a fat guy? Like, why did you want to um, You know, at, at the time, I, I was a little on the plump side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back back when I was sort of 18, 19, 20 in there. Um, and, and, and later on, I, I became the skinny guy. So anyway, I can talk about that. But yeah, I, I just felt, I remember uh, um, watching the 1976 Olympics on television sitting there uh you know, on the couch uh i don't know eating something smoking a cigarette probably uh and and thinking wow you know all these people are in just tremendous shape and look at me you know so i, I should do something about this um so i you know i got interested in it and um so a little later on this was this was the 1970s a little later on the running craze uh really started going on um no nobody really ran much before then and my first exposure to it i thought wow this is kind of crazy people are really doing this huh and then and then uh you know so i started doing it and liked it and kept at it um and before long i was running long distances so like you know I, long distances or? well yeah so i i have run a couple of marathons in my life mm -hmm. um and you know i was doing pretty good mileage every day go out do on the weekends do a, a long run you know 12 to 15 miles that kind of thing and um so i liked it kept at it and then another thing was um i I just, you know, I want, I wanted to be healthy. Right. So, um, my, my father had developed heart disease at a, you know, in middle age, pretty young age, he was not even 50. So, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately he lived a long life. Um, but you know, this, this heart disease certainly affected him and I could see that and it, it affected me too. I decided, you know, like, you know, no way do I want that to happen to me. Um, so I got on the, uh, you know, low saturated fat bandwagon, which, you know, everybody was saying, um, and this especially took off, like say after around 1980. So, um, ultimately I became a vegetarian and a vegan. I, oh, really? I'm, That's a yes. big change from your narrative today too. A absolutely. I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it now, but I, I did do that. Okay, so when you're uh, talking about like meat, like you're like you're speaking from experience as somebody that was prior vegan. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so, so really, what happened without without you know going into long, tedious detail is I ultimately became ill from my from you know veganism from and then from running long distances put on top of that. 
um, you know, hard to say what factor was, you know, doing what, but anyway, I became ill. And were you, were you the typical, like thin, like almost sickly look, looking like I, runner body vegan looking guy? Cause I, I, I I've was. seen a few of those guys out there. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Eventually, uh, you know, after a while, yes, I, I eventually. What sort became, of disease did you end up with way. by, by sticking to, to like a plant-based diet? Cause I mean, I've heard all sorts of stories, like you can end up with neurological, uh, type of diseases cause it's very difficult to get all the nutrients your body needs just from plants that that is absolutely correct so ultimately i had a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome really is not much of a diagnosis they they give it to you when they when they can't figure out anything else mm -hmm. um fatigue is is one of the major things that people complain about when they go to a doctor so there's just a whole you know, a ton of things that can cause somebody to be fatigued, you know, mm -hmm. so they, you know, they start investigating, um, and trying to figure out what the cause of it is. And then eventually when they can't figure out, you know, that there's no seeming cause for your fatigue that, and, and it's unrelenting fatigue, there's certain characteristics of it. Like you don't, you're not refreshed by sleep, this kind of thing, then you've got chronic fatigue you? syndrome. How old were you at that point? So at that at that point, I was uh, how old was I? Forty one, forty two, something like that. Um, okay. Right. Um, so then began a uh, long odyssey. Um, it uh, eleven years to be precise of trying to figure this out, um, and I went to numerous doctors most of whom could do nothing for me and a good fraction of whom didn't seem to, I, I don't know, didn't seem to care. didn't seem to be able to do anything. Didn't, you know, they, they were like, well, I don't know. They just don't seem <laughs> to know most of the time. do they? Yeah. Right. So, you know, there, there were some good ones. I eventually found a good doctor who, you know, who's basically willing to help, mm -hmm. you know, willing to try, almost anything um you know but for for many years you know nothing happened nothing got better um and and eventually i came to the point where i thought if i i really at this point you know in the middle of all this i thought i was going to be this way for the rest of my life um and so at some point i I thought, well, if I'm not going to be like this for the rest of my life, I get, I have to figure it out for myself because the doctors are coming up with nothing. Um, and you know, so, so I decided, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I will try to figure it out. So my, uh, educational background, I, I have a degree in microbiology and, um, I've studied pharmacology as well. So, you know, I was relatively, uh, you know, comfortable with going through the medical and scientific literature and I could understand it. And, and so I just jumped in. Um, and one of the first things that I came across in, in doing this was that I figured out that being a vegan or a vegetarian was probably not a good idea. How did you come um, across that? Like, how did you arrive at that? Well, um, it has to do with protein intake mm -hmm. um, and glutathione. So glutathione is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this brief, not get too technical, but glutathione is the most important internal an antioxidant that human beings have that mammals have it's made by the way you cells. asked me the other day about what was in my vitamin bag and they do inject glutathione into the bag too <laughs> right right yeah. i saw that yes um so w what had happened in in my medical odyssey was that there were there were of course lots of lab tests done and nothing ever turned up abnormal or not very abnormal anyway mm -hmm. not enough to explain anything finally the one doctor did a test for glutathione and um this is a test that's not commonly done in the lab like uh, you know it's a it's a it's a special test only a few labs do it mm -hmm. um 
and it came back abnormal. Um, and so that was kind of a revelation because it was the first time that, you know, anything like that had come back abnormal. So I, I delved into looking at glutathione. Glutathione is a protein. So it's a, it's a small protein made of three amino acids. So where do amino acids come from? They come from protein. Um, and so if you, you know, the idea being, if you don't get enough protein or enough of the right protein, you will be making enough glutathione. There is actually some, uh, you know, there are studies, uh, about this, that, that, uh, people who don't eat meat do have lower levels of glutathione. So anyway, that was one of the first clues. Um, and at, at that, at that point, at that very moment, I, I was not totally convinced the, the, the way I phrase it just now about that. I thought that being a being a vegetarian or vegan was not a good idea that was that was about the most i could get was it a bad idea uh well i didn't know at the time but i thought there's no harm in not doing it anymore you know and at, at the time i was still buying the whole saturated fat causes heart disease kind of thing mm -hmm. not that i was in any in any danger of heart disease at the time but anyway so i quit quit being a, a vegetarian quit being a vegan and um felt better pretty quickly um like like within the first couple of days of eating meat or was it within a I, week or two I, I wouldn't i wouldn't say it was quite that quick but certainly within a month or two i was noticeably better and what did you um, notice immediately like like what were the biggest changes from a, a plant diet to a I mean, did you go right from plant to carnivore or did you just inc incorporate more meat into like salads and stuff like that? Well, well, it was more like, uh, so it wasn't going to straight carnivore. No, it was more, more like a paleolithic diet. And I, I had a few stumbles there at the beginning because one of the first versions I read uh, about the paleo diet was from someone, Lauren Cordain, who was, um, big on you know, he still believed the saturated fat stuff about heart disease, you know, so I, so I, I read his stuff and decided to follow that. And I was basically really hungry all the time doing this. It was, it was that, so it didn't last that long, that particular version. Okay. Um, and then, but then I went more to just sort of, uh, you know, meat and vegetables, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and got rid of all the processed stuff, all the non paleo stuff, um, with, you know, with a few exceptions, um, and, and felt better pretty, you know, relatively quickly. Can you I spell was... out for the people watching, like what that, what that looked like on a daily basis? Like, was it steak, chicken, fish, like salads? Like, what did you? Right. So, uh, w what would it be? Um, it, it would be very similar to what I'm doing now. So that would be, um, uh, yes, I eat steak. Uh, I eat some chicken, I eat some fish. Um, I eat fermented dairy products like, uh, yogurt, uh, and cheese. And, um, I drink coffee and tea. I drink red wine. Um, I eat a few vegetables, um, Probably, I'm not sure how many I would eat if the lady of the house wasn't uh, cooking them and serving them to me, but I do eat some. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's what it looks like. Um, and so in any case, you know, I, I did feel better. I, I was still fatigued and so on. Um, but at, at one point, I thought, you know, wow, you know, I, I feel you know, on some particular day, I, I've got some good energy here. And um, I had wanted to take up weightlifting again. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I had done it a few times in my life before. Um, and so I had an old barbell, you know, sitting in my uh sitting So you did no resistance apartment. training on muscles at all during the whole vegan time? I did do some, yes. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, it wasn't the most effective way, you know, based on what I know now, and I'm sure I wasn't getting enough protein to, you know, support muscle growth, but I did do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but my major focus was on running. Um, 
so anyway, I, I picked up my, my old barbell and started doing a few things and managed to eke out about 15 minutes of, of a workout and, and it was exhausting. Um, and then I rested a day and then the day after that I did it again. Um, and was feeling better. It, it felt good to do that. And, and after, uh, after a few weeks of doing this, I realized I needed heavier weights. Uh, and so I went and joined a gym. Mm -hmm. It's something I had never done before and, um, and just kept at it. And eventually the first year I did that, I put on, you know, 25 to 30 pounds of muscle. Um, it was very rapid That's progress. Quite substantial. It, it is substantial. I, I came from, uh, are you a tall guy say, or do you have a shorter frame? Um, average. Okay. Right. That's still, right. That's still quite a lot of muscle, especially for a, a guy that's like well into his like middle ages of his life. Right. It, sure. Sure. It is. Um, I came from, I, you know, I was very thin to be, to begin with. Right. Mm -hmm. So, a, you know, a lot of that was just like the, working um, out hard and eating. Like the picture you have here on your Twitter banner at, at 53, like that, that to me looks like a standard vegan runner. It, it, Exactly. And that's right. what I, that's what I was. Yes. Okay. Right. Although by that time I wasn't able to run because of my fatigue, but, um, yes. Yeah, so, so that photo you just showed, that is the base of, you know, that that's where I started in, in, in my, uh, weightlifting. And, um, so, so I did it. I put on a lot of muscle in, in the first year and mm -hmm. felt really good. And, and, then, you know, at some point along the way, I had told myself that if I, if I ever figured out, you know, if I could ever get out of this, if I could ever fix myself and figure out how, you know, how it's done, that I should write about it. Mm -hmm. So at some point later on, I was like, oh, well, and I thought, oh, yeah, I remember I was going to write about it. So I did. And so I, I wrote a book. First one, it was about chronic fatigue put it up on, uh, Amazon Kindle. And, and then, uh, a after that I was like, well, what am I going to do now? Well, I, I guess I'll just keep writing. And so I did. And, um, you know, I have, uh, started my website and wrote some more books eventually, um, ended up on Twitter, which is my main venue these days. It's just a much more, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, ready, readily available format to, to get to people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so end of story. That's, that's, that's my origin story. That's, right. that's how I got where I am here. Yeah. I, I had no idea that you were a vegan runner, um, for a length of time. I mean, I just, um, I mean, I came across you about a year or so ago, I think. And, um, you know, uh, I've just found that the content that you've put out has been quite useful, especially when it comes to self-care and, and health. And I mean, you seem to have the same sort of mindset when it comes to life and everything else too. Um, but the, but the weight training for you started at age 53, roughly. Right. That's, that's right. That's, that's when it started in earnest up how, until uh, now. And I don't know if you can answer this because I mean, you started at 53, but how is weight training at, at that stage of your life as a guy different from somebody that might be in their twenties or thirties? Um, I don't know that it is so different. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of myths around, uh, age and exercise, like especially weight training, that it's harder to build muscle uh, past a certain age, past the age of 50. I've even seen people say, Oh, after 40, you know, you can't do it. And this is not true at all. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, there is some age related decline in the ability to build muscle, but it is just not very significant at all. That's far from the, um, dominant factor in, in being able to put on weight. You just, you know, you work out it, it at its most basic level, is you work out hard and you eat right and you put on muscle that, you know, that's, that's how it works. So, um, older, older men do have, um, 
let, let's say let's say uh, uh, they have to they have to watch their recovery time better. Is, they need it, more recovery time. They need more else. recover recovery time. Exactly. So, so if you worked you, out like every other day, let's say, or did three or four days a week when you were in your twenties, could you still get away with that? In 50s and 60s, it, or it, well, in my 20s, I could. Uh, in in my 50s and 60s, so like right now, I certainly can't. And the the thing is, what I want to make clear is, I I I don't recommend that anybody do that. That sort of you know four or five days a week in the gym working, you know, for too much. It, yeah, I believe it's too much. Mm -hmm. And and um. So, yeah, so, you know, but younger guys can get away with that more. Um, I, you know, I believe in basically minimally effect, minimal effective dose of exercise um, that's go going to be the most effective for you. So this um, my my view on this as far as how much how often you should train is partly borne out by experience because I have spent a lot of time um, feeling not not so great in terms of energy levels because I was working out too much. I see this in my clients quite often um, where, you know, this is this is especially true of, um, you know, high performing men. They they want to exercise. They want to uh, they want to be healthy and fit, um, and tend to go at it a lot. So there, there are guys out there that are going hard at it every day mm -hmm. and they feel tired all the time and they don't know why. And, and usually when I, you know, when I find out about their, their exercise regimen, it, you know, that that's the first thing to look at. Um, if they're, you know, going to, going to CrossFit four times a week or something like that, it's just a whole lot of exercise. The, the amount of exercise that, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here. So, you know, feel free to, you know, reel me back. No, in I'm listening, man. I'm, I'm, hey, you know, school me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So th the amount of exercise that is uh, conducive to health and fitness um, the, the optimum amount of exercise is surprisingly low. Um, th there have been some studies, for example, where they looked at runners, joggers, and um, looked at them in terms of mortality rates. And they found that the, the people who were doing something on the order of running like a couple of miles at a time, two to three days a week, had the lowest mortality levels compared compared to people who did no exercise. Um, and then when people did more than that, there was either no effect or a detrimental effect. Similar thing has been found in weightlifting where people who did, uh, I, I think it was a couple of sessions a week had lower mortality rates, but they found that the people who were doing four to five sessions a week basically the mortality was flat it's just as if they weren't exercising at all mm -hmm. um and certainly so you know this this does get tricky because you're looking at populations of people there's all kinds of factors involved um but certainly it's it's my view that when you get up into things like distance running for example marathon running um, you're certainly getting into a level of exercise that is not beneficial to health, um, and, and is, is detrimental to health. So, uh, you know, there, there have been, uh, studies where they looked at heart problems in marathon runners. Um, so men who had been running long distance all their lives and, you know, found that they had this, um, you know, fibrosis in their hearts. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that, um, yeah, that too much exercise is not good for you. What that level of too much exercise is, you know, can be a little hard to determine. Um, but in, in terms of the way someone feels, 
um, and in their day-to-day -day life, certainly it's, it is definitely possible to exercise too much. And a lot of people are doing it. Yeah. I think your body like knows how to tell you when you're going too hard on it. Like I, I remember this, um, this friend's cottage that I went to a few years ago before all this COVID stuff went, went down and he goes, yeah, you know, bring your mountain bike up. There's some good trails up here. And I haven't, I don't mountain bike that often, but I got a nice bike. So I figured, all right, you know, let's, let's go do it. And he took me out on, it was like a two and a half hour ride through very hilly terrain. And I got out of the thing with my heart just pounding like crazy. And I was like, this can't be good. Like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm exhausted. Like my, like my heart's going a million miles an hour. Yeah, it was kind of fun, but it was more like torture, right? And I right. thought the same thing, you know, right. before when I would run, because my dad used to run, you know, and when I was younger, I'd go out with him. It's like, you know, you do a few miles and I'm like, this is like, this can't be good. This is, this is getting silly. Right, right. This, this, uh, you know, chronic endurance exercise um, just seems to be, you know, something that, that, well, at least it's not optimal. Uh, there's been a, a lot of interesting work done in the last couple of decades about high intensity interval training. So this is something like where people, um, it, when they do it in the lab, this is how they do it. They sit on a stationary bicycle with, you know, uh, fine tuned control. So they have the, the resistance adjusted just so right. Wired and, up to everything with a mask and well th that that particular thing with a mask would be so for vo2 max testing mm -hmm. um but this particular protocol for high intensity interval training is just you know basically getting on the stationary cycle and riding all out for 30 seconds mm -hmm. um and some sometimes even shorter so there have been direct head-to-head -head comparisons of um, this type of exercise with aerobic training, cardio training, in other words, which is basically slow, steady state endurance training. It turns out that people, so, so they get these guys in the, in, into the gym or training center and they do this, um, high intensity interval training, or more specifically, they call it sit sprint interval training, which when they do it on the bicycle on the stationary cycle, and they do, uh, this one particular one where they did 15 second all out bouts on the cycle interspersed with a few minutes in between at low, low intensity cycling, you know, and then they do it again. So they did a total of four of these 15 second intervals. So a total of one minute of intense exercise, not including, of course, warm up, cool down and the, the low intensity in between mm -hmm. do that three times a week. Then they compared it to people who were uh, running on a treadmill for 45 minutes at, um, also three days a week and the same physiological changes were seen in both groups. So the, the one minute of exercise three times a week did the same things in terms of increasing fitness as spending all that time on the treadmill running. So intensity of exercise really matters a lot. Um, it, it's a very important factor if you get the intensity right, the volume and frequency of exercise can go way down. So that that's how I look at it. And that's how I look at my weight training as well. Yes. Yeah, so that, your personal strategy is one rep max. No, not one rep max. It's going to momentary so, muscular failure. So, so it's, so it's failure, but, but, but one, um, but one set, one set. One exactly. set to failure, right? So if you're doing chin-ups, you'll do as many chin-ups as you can do until you can't pull yourself up. Exactly. Push-ups, you'll right. keep pushing up until you can't push up again, right? E exactly. Exactly right. right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, that this is uh, uh, a, di a very different method of training. Um, it's been espoused by some prominent people, but it certainly differs a lot from what the majority of people are doing in the gym. Some mm -hmm. of these prominent people like Mike Metzer, Arthur Jones, um, um, Casey Viator, some others too, 
uh, uh, advocate this method. And Drew Bay on Twitter uh, mm -hmm. also advocates this. Um, and it, it involves intense exercise, but it's much, much less frequent and, and lower volume. Mm. Um, I want to ask you about uh, testosterone therapy. What's your, what's your view on that for the aging guy? So my view on that is that it's fine, basically. Um, however, I think that most men would be better off um, taking care of the other stuff first. In other words, their health and fitness, losing body fat, putting on muscle, getting their diet right. I think that TRT is possibly resorted to by both doctors and patients a little too quickly. Mm. Um, that said, if somebody needs it, if they've taken care of all the other stuff, their diet, their, you know, their level of body fat and their muscle and so on, their sleep, all this kind of thing, and they still need, uh, help in, in that area, then I, I think TRT is fine. I think you mentioned somewhere in a tweet that you're still natural. I am. Yes. Okay. Um, is there a reason why you haven't considered, uh, adding testosterone therapy to what it is you're doing? Is it not needed or is it like, is there a risk benefit analysis that you've done? Um, not really risk benefit. No, it's more a matter of, uh, I do have a normal testosterone level. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't, you know, terribly felt the need. I, you know, I've thought about it. I think it, I think my, um, I think it has a lot to do with do I want to add something else? Do I, do I want to be uh, injecting myself twice a week with something that I'm just going to have to keep doing for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the foreseeable future years? Um, and I'm getting along okay without it. So I just thought, well, nah, I don't, I don't think I will. Yeah, there was a, there's a podcast, I think it was on Andrew Huberman, and he had some data collected on, like, there's some anomalies out there where there's 80 year old guys that have higher levels of testosterone than many guys in their 20s. It's not, it's not normal. It's, it's more abnormal. I mean, I, I, I started uh, adding uh, testosterone therapy, I'm gonna say it was about four or five years ago. And I mean, I was already fit, I was able to you know, in pretty good shape, but I had all the signs of, you know, declining teeth starting to show up and my levels weren't low per se on the government tables. Cause they just, you know, when you can't dunk the ball in the net, they just lower the, you know, the net for you when you get older. Um, so I had done a lot of research and I asked a bunch of guys around and I figured, you know, this is right for me, but I get what you're saying. Like the whole notion where you have to rely on a exogenous source of a hormone for pretty much the rest of your life. Um, it's a little bit daunting, right? Because I mean, like, what happens if they right. run out of it? What happens if the shit hits the fan and it's not available to you anymore? Like, there's all kinds of questions that could come up there, right? Right, right, exactly. Um, the the yeah, it's interesting what you what you mentioned about the um, eighty year olds with high testosterone because I've seen that data too. Um, there there is a you know a, a small fraction of men. In, into their who into their 80s have Outliers, yeah. you know like uh, 900 testosterone level something like that um the, you know so the question is how do they do it um is it is there a genetic component well there's a genetic component to everything so yeah there probably is some genetic component but mm -hmm. um are they you know i'd like to see what these guys look like like are they in shape they work out they're eating right all this kind of thing certainly if you do those things you have more of a chance of you know being one of those men that that has high testosterone levels and also i was just going to remark yeah you know they lower the testosterone level ranges what's considered normal uh, they just did this about three years ago i think where the the lower they they lowered the the lower end of the range. So basically if you go to a doctor and you've got a testosterone that's anywhere within this range that they deem normal, then the doctor's going to say, ah, you're good. Don't worry about it. Um, mm. and, and that is certainly not correct. Yeah. I mean, I've seen guys message me in their twenties with their labs and I, I don't analyze this shit. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I, I, I send them off, but it's like, I'll look at the numbers and it's like, wow, you're like, that's, that's some low ass numbers for a 23 year old. Like, what are you doing? Right. Um, it's right. interesting. Um, 
I want to ask you about um, anti-aging. I mean, do you have an anti-aging protocol to longevity, to health? Um, like, is there a supplement stack that you look at? I'm just curious on what your position on that is. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I discovered, you know, fairly early on looking at all this stuff was that body composition is really important for aging. So when you look at the changes that... Um, you know, that someone, you know, that someone has when they get old, when, as they age, a lot of this resembles the same changes that you see in obesity and diabetes. So they're not necessarily of the same magnitude. If, if, in other words, if somebody stays lean and fit, they're going to have fewer of these changes, but these changes do seem to be intrinsic to to aging mm -hmm. people lose muscle that is a big one um that that is very uh underrated so if you don't consciously try to keep muscle the, then you're going to lose it and this starts from a very fairly young age say the age of 30. Uh, there's also a direct seen. correlation if i'm not mistaken between skeletal muscle mass like lean skeletal muscle mass and diseases I think like Alzheimer's, dementia, like there's a lot of degenerative diseases as you get older as a guy that you're more likely to, to get if you don't have, I mean, not, not bodybuilder size muscle, obviously, but like lean skeletal muscle on your body where, I mean, I tell guys, look, if you can't do 20 push ups, 10 chin ups and skip rope for a minute or two, at, like at least start there. Like that's a basic foundational sort of like requirement for most guys. And that should be the same if you're 30 or 50 or even 60. I mean, you should be able to do something basic like that at any age. So what's the relevance to the amount of like skeletal muscle mass when it comes to um, minimizing, limiting aging, you know, degenerative diseases and all that stuff? Well, well so, you know, skeletal muscle is uh, what one way of looking at it is a, it's a metabolic sink. So, uh, most of the energy that that uh, you use has to do with skeletal muscle, mm -hmm. uh, and and I mean unless you were, if you were completely sedentary, um, you know a lot of the energy just goes to you know maintaining your basal metabolic rate, um, but your skeletal muscle uses a lot of energy. It's a sink for for glucose, um, and so it is very important in aging, and and the fact that a, a man who gets to the age of 80 can have lost half the muscle mass he had when he was 20. Right. Um, so that's a huge amount. Mm -hmm. And so one, one consequence of this is that people become frail and they become, you know, if, if this goes, of course, we're, we're generally talking here about quite elderly people, but, if you get frail enough, then you need help living. You know, if you can't get out of your chair by yourself, and this happens a lot, mm -hmm. um, and then people end up in nursing homes for for this reason. Um, but as far as your overall health, there's you know definitely a correlation with the amount of muscle you have. There's a correlation with mortality. So with people have more muscle mass, they have lower death rates. Um, so all these things, and then you know, regarding these changes that, like I was saying, that resemble, you know, diabetes or obesity, you can fend these off um, with having more muscle mass with doing strength training. So as far as anti-aging goes, I consider this, I consider strength training to be fundamental. And the other part of this, of the training and with regards to aging is keeping body fat off is very important too. So, you know, there, there's, um, older people generally have, uh, poorer metabolism. So this has actually been looked at. So they, they, you know, uh, for example, insulin sensitivity, which is really important. They look at these older people, they, their insulin sensitivity, it, it is not as good as people who are younger. However, when they control for waist size, they find that there's little difference. The difference is, is that these older people put on body fat, put on visceral fat. Mm. And if you can keep that off, 
then your insulin sensitivity is going to be uh, very nearly that of a younger person. Speaking it's, of insulin sensitivity, what's your take on metformin as an, as an anti-aging compound? Do you take that? Is that something that you recommend? I, I, I have taken it from time to time. Um, it's one of those things that I can't say that I've noticed anything, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, that, that it's done. The, so this is interesting. Um, so metformin is an anti-diabetic drug. And so this fits in with what I was just saying. As as people age, they have these manifestations of something that resembles changes towards towards diabetes. And this also, uh, so metformin, an anti-diabetic -di drug, fights aging. So it has been shown to extend lifespan in lab animals. Now the question is, in my mind, does metformin do anything for someone who is already lean and fit um it, you know or is it merely combating what we uh you know are basically our modern food environment our modern sedentary environment you know what is it doing my i've thought about this a lot read about it a lot my view is yes it may it may do something for older people who are already lean and fit and doing everything it 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 obviously, like with so many things, it does more for people who need it more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, there's going to be a clinical trial of metformin um, to to uh, to see to look at its anti-aging effects in humans. Um, w you know, one thing about metformin is it's dirt cheap. Um, you you know, you can pick it up for like five or six cents a, a tablet. And so, and it's generic. So there's very little incentive for people to study it, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in human beings. Uh, most, most of the work has been, been done in animals. But of course, a lot of people take metformin. It's the most prescribed anti-diabetic drug. So they've looked at a lot of these uh, populations too. What about um, other compounds? I was watching this... Uh conversation with uh dr david sinclair i think is his name do you know who he is yes i do uh -huh. and huberman they were talking about anti-aging and longevity and i think the two compounds that stood out um were resveratrol i, I don't know if i'm pronouncing that right um, resveratrol that, yeah that's it and uh something else called nmn which um studied in lab animals apparently extended their lives like by something like thirty percent, like lab mice, like live two like two years max is, is pretty standard. They were seeing them live live to like four or five years. Um, what do you know about that stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, so this this is interesting too, um, from the same point of view as metformin. So NMN is uh, nic uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide. There's another similar compound. They're not the same, but nicotinamide riboside. These are both forms of vitamin B3, nicotinamide, or niacin. And, and so nicotinamide is not exactly the same as niacin, but they are both forms of vitamin B3. Um, so it's, and, and they make a certain compound, NAD+, plus, that is important in metabolism that declines with age. So this, this is the basis. I tried taking NR, nicotinamide riboside. I tried taking it for a month, didn't notice anything, and it was quite expensive, so I stopped. There's also some evidence, and th these, these, these people like uh, David Sinclair or uh, Charles Brenner is another one would, might dispute me on this, but there's also some evidence that just taking plain old vitamin B3, nicotinamide, will do the same thing mm -hmm. as far as raising your levels of NAD+. The other thing is that if you look at what happens when people go on a low-carb diet or, or start exercising, uh, with intensity is NAD plus levels also go up. So just like with metformin, what we're looking at here, is this really doing, is, is this going to help lean and healthy pe people who are already lean and healthy, who are old, like NMN, is it going to do that? You know, I, I don't know. I have to be agnostic on it. I'm, I'm not taking it. Um, and I feel like my diet and exercise is probably keeping my NAD plus levels 
just as high as they can possibly be. And and if you take vitamin B3, nicotinamide, plain old, see, these supplements like NMN or NR, um, I, I don't want to attribute uh, nefarious motives to people, but one reason that people are looking into these kind of things is because they can make money at it, right? Okay, it's an expensive so, supplement. Sure, expensive supplement, sure. Yeah. And so there's nothing wrong with making money, but if taking plain old vitamin B3, which is really, really cheap, it works the same, obviously they're not interested in looking at that. Mm. There's a very similar one um, a recent article was published on this new uh, supplement called Rejuvent. And Rejuvent, uh, so they, they've they tested it in animals, and it extends lifespan. And they did this study on humans where they looked at um, markers, um, epigenetic markers of aging, and it made, made these markers go down. So mm -hmm. they were epigenetically younger from taking Rejuvent. Well... What is rejuvenate? Rejuvenate is uh, a compound called uh, alpha ketoglutarate and some vitamins. So alpha ketoglutarate, al alpha ketoglutarate, you can go on Amazon and buy a big bag like this from bulk supplements for you know twenty bucks, right? So, but who's going to make money at that? So they have to put it into a proprietary formula. Uh, and and so they can say it's got alpha ketoglutarate and some vitamins, special vitamins, mm -hmm. and yeah, give it a name and then test it on humans, and then they can say, see, look, this study shows rejuvenant, mm. um, you know, and then sell it for fifty, a hundred bucks a month, whatever. Um, so this dynamic is is going on a lot. Rapamycin is another one, a very promising anti aging drug, and. It's more expensive than metformin or or rejuvenant or or NMN or anything like that. However, it's still generic. Nobody has an incentive, you know, to really study it in humans. Um, as far as resveratrol, resveratrol is interesting. I took it for a long time. I'm no longer taking it. Um, resveratrol has has never been shown to extend lifespan in uh, in mammals. Right. So it's extended lifespan in some lower or so-called lower, lower organisms like worms and flies. But um, they give it to mice. It, hel it helps um, protect against the effects of a high fat, high sugar diet in mice. So they actually said so. so sorry, just, that. To, just to correct that, I think he said that if you take it daily, it doesn't have much of an effect. But he said that if you take it every other day, then that's when they saw the longevity effects on the lab mice. Um, well, I don't know about that. The, the, one, the, the one big study that came out uh, maybe 15 years ago that, uh, or 10 years ago that, maybe, that, that seemed to result in a lot of people losing interest in resveratrol was that it did not extend lifespan of these mice, that it did protect against the high fat, high sugar diet. But um, so this is another thing similar like i was just talking about with metformin, metformin or yeah. nad plus is like what is this doing is this protecting against a horrible food environment a horrible sedentary environment or is it really fighting aging mm. um disentangling these things is difficult um because everybody's living in this environment um and Pretty much, you know, I mean, over 80 percent of the U.S. population is either overweight or obese, and it gets worse as is that people what the get number older. Is now? It's like it's like about 80 percent now. It it is yes, wow. and and you know, a lot of the rest of them are skinny fat. So um, it's Same thing. yeah, yeah. I mean, only only uh, one study showed that only 12 percent of the U.S. population was metabolically healthy. That's horrible. Yeah, and, they, and they're cramming all of these jabs in everybody's throats, and you don't do these, you don't get to go anywhere. But they never say anything about losing body fat or eating properly. That that's right, that's right. This this is something that I've talked about quite a bit over the last year and a half. I mean, uh, obesity, diabetes, those two, along with 
pure chronological age are the biggest risk factors for having severe COVID disease and also vitamin D deficiency. Uh, I mean, vitamin D, um, (laughs) you know, you can, you again, it's dirt cheap, just like some of these things we were talking about and nobody's mentioning it. Um, I got to ask you though, like, you know, be specific. Cause I mean, you look good for your age. I mean, it's, 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 it says on your Twitter you're 66, and your skin doesn't look 66. I mean, people might even argue watching this, like, I'm in my late 40s. that We look the same practically as far as the skin condition. Like, what do you take as far as um, supplements for anti-aging for yourself? Is there anything that you rely on at this point? Or is it just, you know, lots of water, good diet, and exercise, and sunlight? I, I, I do take some supplements. Um, I, as, far as, as far as my skin, I guess... Uh, you know, genetics again probably has something to do with it. My 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 mother had nice skin up into a very old age, um, but I do take some supplements. I do credit diet and exercise with a lot of um, you know what I look like and how I feel. It's certainly the most important thing. Uh, people people and and I'll tell you about the supplements, but uh, people want to. The, um, you know, there's this idea of adding something versus subtracting something. So, you know, people want a magic pill, um, something to take that's going to, um, you know, um, negate their bad habits or, you know, anything else they're doing mm-hmm. um, rather than, you know, subtracting what they're they're doing that that isn't helping them. So, um I mean, this phenomenon is not just in the world of supplements or something like that. I mean, every doctor deals with it, right? So, you know, somebody, somebody, uh, you know, goes to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you've got diabetes. Um, and, and the patient says, okay, doc, you know, give me a pill rather than, you know, change the conditions that led them into diabetes. So this, this is just, you know, everywhere. That's what, that's what people are like. So anyway, yes, diet and exercise. Um, I take uh, I take baby aspirin, um, and I have been for quite a while. So there there's some good evidence for that. If you talk about it online, there's all kinds of controversy, but I've decided that it's good for me. Um, and and also, by the way, with baby aspirin, let me just add, there can be serious side effects. So I you know I don't tell people, yeah, go go ahead take take aspirin you know it's something that um basically should be talked over with a doctor and decide whether that's a good thing to do um i take magnesium so magnesium is really important and this is a supplement that probably most everybody could use is there a version Um, that you like theonate shalate i i take uh magnesium citrate so um, okay. There are some other good ones, like glycinate is a good one. It, I think it, uh, theonate's the one that 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 bridges the blood brain barrier. Like that's better for your brain, especially uh, for sleep too. I I believe that is correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so vast numbers of people in the United States are magnesium deficient, oh, yeah. um, and this has to do with a lot of things, like for example, monocrop agriculture has leached magnesium out of the soil. Uh, and, and so they're not getting as much in their, in their diets. People used to get a lot of magnesium from drinking hard water, which they don't anymore. And, um, then other things like caffeine and alcohol can deplete magnesium. So there's all kinds of reasons. So I do take magnesium and I feel that most people would, would benefit from it. Um, what else? I take uh, I take vitamin D. So this is something I've been doing a long time. I take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D every day, except maybe, you know, in the summer when I'm getting some sun. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you so, sunscreen when you're outside in the sun or, or no? No, no, I don't. Uh, I don't use sunscreen. Most of the sunscreens out there are basically toxic brews. Yeah. Um, and there are some that are, that are better. You can find them, but the average like the zinc based ones. Y- yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And oddly enough, um, what is her name? Gwyneth Paltrow, I think has some sunscreens that are like pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if I'm remembering correctly, but they're, you know, you, you got to seek those out. If you just get regular sunscreen, it's no, you don't want to do that. Best sunscreen is 
shade, suntan. clothing, and a hat. <laughs> or suntan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or sun, or suntan. But I mean, people people say, well, you know, people ask me, well, I'm going to be out in the sun all day long. What do I do? I say, well, put on a long sleeve shirt long and sleeve wear a hat. hat you know. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so vitamin D. Um, I take taurine, which is a, an amino acid, which has some good anti aging effects. Um, I over the last what are the anti-aging effects of taurine because i understood it just to be a cell volume volumizer or like an energy source um it it functions as an antioxidant in much the same way as glutathione does or in somewhat the same way yes Mm -hmm. and so we um our cells have the ability to make taurine and we get some in our diet but it does uh deplete with age um so it that that's something that i've i've found useful for me Here's another one, citrulline. This this is a really interesting supplement. Um, citrulline promotes n- the the production of nitric oxide in blood vessels. So mm-hmm. this is very important. Nitric oxide um, allows uh, blood vessels to expand, uh, to dilate, and so this is this is a really important thing. There's good evidence that all of this, the dilation and so on, or lack of it is involved in coronary artery disease and so on. So citrulline um, helps promote nitric oxide uh, production. Um, So that's a good one. And um, it's good for gym pumps. It's also good for bedroom pumps too. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it does. Yeah. The, you you can find uh, citrulline added to, you know, pre-workout you just get a big, supplements. A big and bulk selling. supplement bag off Amazon. Ex- that's the one that I've bought in the past. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So, um, you know, that about covers it. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about peptides too, because um, we were talking about um, sun protection, stuff like that. And I used a peptide this summer. Uh, called melanotan two. Are you familiar with uh, peptides? I, I yes, somewhat. And that uh, melanotan, you know, is basically uh, yeah, it's something something I know a bit about. But but uh, you know, other than that, what I, do you think of these protein based peptides as far as you know use in regular life? Uh, you know, for optimization, health optimization, like all that stuff. Well. Um, I, I'm going to I'll I'll give you my my opinion on this, you know, and my my impression is that a lot of it is kind of, you know, wanting to get same effect or some of the effect is anabolic steroids um, and anabolic steroids are basically a, they're pro aging. All right. So so if someone were, you know, to take, um, you know, some something, uh, you know, I'm not au courant with what everybody's doing now, but Diana Ball or, you know, something like that, Mm. um, you know, to get big in the gym. This is this is definitely pro aging. There is a fundamental trade off in aging between between growth and longevity. Mm. So, for example, the bigger uh, with animals within species, the bigger an animal is, the shorter its lifespan. Mm-hmm. Um, so for probably the best example is dogs. So little dogs live a long time. Big dogs don't. Well, you see uh, in humans too. Like there's not a lot of big men that live into their eighties. Most guys that live past their eighties are shorter. They're more compact. They have a lighter frame. At, exactly exactly right i mean um like big men don't live long yeah i mean like basketball players i i you know reading something about them it was very you know it was poignant to read where these these guys these, these former nba players they're like in their 60s and they're like well it's all coming into an end here because i'm six foot 11 or something like that um and and yes i i mean uh, a, a few years back, there was a, there was a lot of publicity about this uh, a Frenchman, uh, Robert Marchand, and he was uh, like, you know, he was over 100. He was like 105 years old or something. He's out riding his bicycle and, you know, setting these records. Of course, I suppose, you know, setting the, 
there aren't too many other 105 year olds out there so setting the record might not be that tough but in any case he was out there doing this kind of stuff and so i looked into it a little further and it turned out that robert marchand was five feet tall mm. uh you know and and so that you know there you have another example this, this centenarians are shorter and uh you know generally speaking so you know in a roundabout way the steroids thing if it's making you bigger um you know or yeah, growth trade off something like, like that exactly it's like burning the candle at, at at both ends there was uh there was a um video that i watched um on this channel and he's kind of a longevity expert and and, and he brought some data uh on unix um to the table and uh you know collected all this information and apparently it's been studied quite a lot over the last few hundred years and it's and it's and it's very um uh i think the longest study they uh pulled out of it was from korea but there was um i, I think monks or something and they were all eunuchs and they lived considerably longer um than than the average male at the time something like 30 or 35 percent like like that's a ridiculous amount of of time so they found out that testosterone itself in the body I think it's called nephrotoxicity to which basically men, means that it's toxic to your kidneys um, and your kidneys are real important for filtering your blood and you know getting rid of you know fluids out of your body and all that sort of stuff so um, I mean that's one of the reasons why I don't do bodybuilding dosages of testosterone like I'm doing 80 milligrams a week it's it's very low dose right so I don't want to carry around like 250 pounds, you know, worth of muscle. It's like, I'm good. Right. You know, like I'm 210 pounds. I'm six foot two. Like I'm a pretty healthy weight. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, the, the, you know, things like, uh, also things like growth hormone, you know, growth same, hormone same, also accelerates I, it too, yeah. same idea. Right. So, I mean, they, you know, animals that lack growth hormone receptors live longer. Um, the, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Okay, so as far as peptides go, you you don't know a lot about them, or I, I I'm gonna yeah, I don't know a lot about them. I, I think what I just told you is pro probably the extent of my knowledge. All right, um, what have we what have we missed that we haven't talked about yet? Um, we got about an hour into this. I, I figure we got about another thirty minutes left. Is there anything else that we should cover? Um, On well let and, well uh, let's let's see. So. So yeah, we were, how about we were this? Talking... How about this? Because there's something that always comes up with uh, guys. It's like, how do I maximize my experience as a as a seasoned man in the bedroom? Like, what tips do you have for guys on sexual performance? Well, so uh, prob probably the 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 biggest tip is PDE five inhibitors, aka Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. Mm -hmm. um, those things. So. What they do is very similar to what citrulline does. They increase nitric oxide, um, and and the there's actually an a, an upside to this. So these PDE five inhibitors, um, like Viagra, have they have a lot of potential to treat a lot of diseases. Uh, for instance, both heart disease and cancer and other things, maybe Alzheimer's. So the potential. What you see when some when some drug or other intervention, what, uh, you know, be it physical exercise or calorie restriction or anything, affects all diseases, that tends to mean that it is slowing aging, um, because the 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 biggest uh, you know aging is the biggest factor in chronic disease. So I mean, for example, heart disease, um, you know heart disease is not seen in very many people uh, say under 60 um but over 65 70 you know lots and lots of people have it same with cancer you know some something like uh you know 75 percent of cases of cancer are people over 65 years old um and and and, and you know dementia alzheimer's disease com totally rare in in somebody uh, under let's say 55 very rare so these are all diseases of aging so if you find that a drug or intervention affects multiple diseases like this then that's the clue that it is fighting aging so these pde5 inhibitors seem to be having that effect now i i have postulated that 
so, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, someone is going to come along and do an experiment on lab animals and give them Viagra and find out that they live longer because they're taking it. Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, no one has done that um, yet, but but I think that could happen. So um, the these drugs are, you know, very interesting for that reason. They're they're um, you know, the risk benefit ratio seems to be very good. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there yeah. was, um, uh, I think there was an ebook. Um, do you know who Jay Campbell is? Oh yeah. Yeah. Buddy, yeah. buddy of mine actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think Jay was talking about his, um, top three stack was, uh, five milligram daily Cialis, metformin and testosterone, you know, for like a longevity stack testosterone at therapeutic, do like low dosages, obviously. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, all right. Well, I want to ask you about um, some personal stuff because, I mean, like as a seasoned guy that's been around, I know that you've followed my stuff. I wanted to get your take on, um, you know, the, like some of the stuff that I talk about, you know, around, um, you know, getting better results with women and all that and life. I think you said that you've been through a divorce as well. Definitely have. Yes. Yeah. What tips do you have for guys from, you know, from your own experience there? Well, I think, um, you know, I think self-confidence is really supreme this is something that i've learned about um may, maybe the hard way and and maybe only relatively recently in life um and you know what what one of the themes of you know what you what you talk about that that i like is um make, making yourself the center um uh, making your I'm not sure exactly how you put it first your own mental point of origin basically exactly exactly yeah. right and um rather than you know thinking that um getting a woman in, into your life is going to solve your problems um and i and i think that <laughs> i think exacerbates them if you have it, them. <laughs> it, yeah right right so i think um uh, i think that's that's something i've learned you know another thing this is this is tangentially related and this is something that i talk about on uh you know on twitter is the pack of lies that we've all been sold um you know and this has definitely you know there's there there's a set of lies that come with relationships and marriage and so on um there's a lot of lies that come with uh education making a living and of course health and fitness these things uh, are um the the people who the people who are are telling you these things um have ulterior motives let's say and 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 let me just even say without necessarily bad faith for many of them but mm -hmm. but they do i mean you know the adage don't ask a barber if you need a haircut. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't ask a guidance counselor if you need more education. I mean, th they will say yes every time. And mm -hmm. it's not just the guidance counselor in, in particular. It, it, it comes from society as a whole. Everybody's got to go to college, all this kind of thing. Work. Um, thing, you know, okay, things are very different now, for sure. I mean, I was... 40 years old the first time i used the internet so it wasn't around um so things things are definitely different for a lot of guys but you know the idea of going to a nine to five every day monday through friday it's something you hate because you've got to make a living and that's just the way it is um is is something let's just say most men should really think deeply about this um i my my personal experience is i look back over my life my career for example and a whole lot of it was spent doing things i did did not like um there are definitely worse jobs i'm not gonna you know go on about how it was so terrible but it was um not very interesting for the most part and um, often stressful and so on. Why was I doing that? Well, you know, maybe I didn't see any alternative. Um, fortunately, I do now. 
you know, so I'm, I'm not saying there are set answers here, but I think that men, um, women too, really should be looking at this idea that there's this defined path through their life that is all set for them. And that's the best way. Um, I, I, you know, no longer believe that retirement. There's another thing. Um, it's my impression that most men retire because they hate their jobs. Um, why would you retire if you're doing something fulfilling, making good money, all this kind of thing? You know, what are you, what are you going to do? Go fishing or sit in front of Netflix? I mean, yeah, it's crazy I'm not. that guys will work till whatever it is, like 65. And then most people live, I think it's an average of 11 years after retirement before they die. So you're basically spending your entire life doing something you hate to quit one day to get 11 years in a body that's not as healthy as it would have been, you know, years back if you use it for other things. Right. Absolutely. It, it re, retirement is a trap that way. And I think it's a trap. A lot of people die shortly after. Retire. I it, can't see myself ever retiring. Like people say like, why do you keep working? Like you don't need to work. You don't need money. It's like, cause I like doing what I'm doing. Like I like, I like having these conversations. Absolutely. Um, I, I feel very much the same. Why would I want to retire? What, what am I going to do? Um, uh, this is, I, I, I'm very fortunate in that in these last few years, in these last three to five or, or a few more years, I have found something that I really like doing that, um, uh, I'm able to do every day that, yeah, it's, it's, it's fulfilling. I like it. Why, why would I stop? Um, how did you find that? How, how did I find it? Yeah. You, you mean, how did I find what I'm doing or like, I mean, it sounds like you're basically defining what I would call your purpose, right? Like I tell guys to like, get on a grind, find a purpose, like put a little dent in the universe, like, you know, have some sort of impact on people's lives. And it sounds like you found that. I mean, could you, could you point to anything? Is there, are there things that led up to that? Like, how would you define that? Cause a lot of, a lot of younger guys out there, they're like, well, I don't really know what I want to do. Right. Um, so, you know, what led me into this was of course, you know, what I talked about before about my, you know, my health and fitness journey. But when, when you are, uh, you know, when you're working in, in an office or, you know, in my case, working in healthcare, you're a cog in the machine and you're, you're definitely replaceable. Um, when you're doing something that you like, uh, you, you are, you are not, re, you know, replaceable. You, what you said about finding a purpose, I think this is really all important. I think it's about, uh, well, the, the the term uh, I often think of is self actualization. Mm -hmm. So you, I'm sure you know about Maslow's hierarchy, where you have the basic needs and it goes on up, and yeah. at the peak you've got self actualization. I feel like this is something that I have looked for my life. I felt that I had things, I was able to do things, think things that should come out. Um, but, but I was unable to do that until I, you know, I got into, into, um, you know, what I'm doing now. So having a sense of purpose is all important. That's why retirement is so bad because people lose their sense of purpose. Um, so yeah, um, how, you know, how someone can find that? Well, I, I'm less sure about that. It would, would require some experimentation. Um, if they're just you know, going on a walkabout and sort of, yeah, like you said, like experimenting, doing things like a buddy of mine once said, you know, in the absence of clarity, do something like, don't like, don't just sit there milling over it in the absence of, just start moving in a direction because you're going to, you're going to walk up against a wall. Okay. That's not it. You know, can you walk through the wall? Can you find a way around it? Can you climb over it? No. Nope. Okay. Well, let's go over in this direction, right? That's how you do it. It's, it's not having somebody you know, hand it to you on a silver platter that says, Hey, Bill, you know, here's your purpose now. So go out and do it. You'll be, and you'll feel fulfilled. Like you'll reach the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy. It, it's, it's just, just start doing stuff, right. You know, it, find stuff that you like and start doing it. it absolutely. Yeah. You know, in, 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 uh, in my line of work, um, I, I've talked to a, a number of people who've helped me out, uh, as far as the business side of things. And one of the things, uh, that has been said to me a lot is don't overthink it, mm. just do it. 
Um, and, and so, you know, if you make a mistake, okay, you make a mistake, you, you correct it and move on. But you, but just thinking about what I'm going to do and then, uh, uh, bringing up imaginary problems that haven't happened yet. Uh, like what, what do I do if this thing happens? Well, you know, worry about that when it does happen. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just beginning to do things, if somebody is good at something and they like it and they can figure out a way to make a living at it, that's obviously, you know, yeah. one of the best ways to go. I mean, like you figured it out. There's a lot of people that don't even understand the basics and you're one of those, you know, guys, you know, like you said that you just started using the internet when you were in, you know, 40 or so. So, um, there's, there, the, the barrier to video production, writing a book to, uh, setting a newsletter, it's never been lower. You don't need anybody's permission to do these things today. It's, it's completely permissionless, you know, in practicality. I got one more question for you before we go. Sure. Um, you mentioned that you like to do a lot of research. What, what did you come across in your lifetime that was like, uh, I like to call these a frying pan to the forehead moment. Like, holy cow, this is, this is profound. Like what, what piece of data, what research did you come across that really changed the direction in the way that you live and do things? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it changed the, the way that I live and do things except in, you know, minor ways, but, uh, I came across the relationship of iron to, to aging. And this is important for men. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a book about it and I've ri actually written a scholarly article about it that was just published uh, a couple months ago. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, iron and aging men accumulate iron, uh, a as they get older women, much less so. Um, and, and this may very well bear on the fact that, uh, men don't live as long as women. Um, so yeah, so I've, I've written a lot about that. I, I suppose that's, uh, maybe not, not a mind blowing revelation, but, and, and I certainly didn't discover it myself. I've just, uh, put a lot of it together in, in, uh, in a form that people can understand. Um, but it's certainly in a, a, a non-intuitive result that people were not looking at. And, um, it seems to be quite important. So having higher iron levels is directly correlated to a shorter, sicker life. Correct. It is. It so, is. And, um, so I mean, a question for you then. So I, I usually do like a blood dump every four months or so. Like I'll go and donate blood. Um, one of the things my, my, my old doctor used to say, I've got a new doctor now, but one of the old things that he used to say is that, you know, you don't want your blood to get rusty. And I think he was referencing iron. So so getting rid of blood like that sort of sort of helps with that like it helps solve that problem right and i think i i think i noticed that on your your post where you were getting that iv that you had had a therapeutic phlebotomy at, yeah. at the same time right so yes um so iron is stored in the body it's it's totally necessary for life um, but we accumulate too much of it most of the iron in your body is in your blood, in your red blood cells. So when you donate blood or do a therapeutic phlebotomy, you're getting rid of a lot of iron. Then when you make the new red blood cells, uh, the body takes iron from the rest of your body and makes new red blood cells out of it. So therefore, your overall body iron level goes down. Um, they're, they're, uh, you know, blood donors have... Um, lower mortality levels, uh, lower mortality rates, lower levels of heart disease and, and so on. So, uh, yes, this, this is how you do it. Um, women naturally do it before menopause, after menopause, their iron levels tend to go up after a few years to the same level as that of men. But men in their forties have uh, iron levels approximately four to five times higher than women of the same age. And they have much higher rates of heart disease and cancer and so on. Mm. Um, so yes. Um, uh, and, and there, there are some, some good indications that I've theorized about in my recent article that iron is directly involved in aging and that keeping iron levels in, in a low normal level can, um, slow aging. It's good to know. Well, I appreciate that. Um, let's just throw your Twitter up. So best place to find you, uh, you mentioned is on Twitter. So, uh, it's man, M A N G A N one fifty. 
Uh, give him a follow. He also has a link uh, for one-on-one coaching. What sort of one-on-one coaching do you do again? Yeah, I do health and fitness coaching. I've got a 12 week uh, program and mm-hmm. they can contact me for further details. Um, I've coached hundreds of people, mo- mostly men, probably 90% men, mm-hmm. a few women in there, but yes. Perfect. All right, Petey, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. Um, just stick around for a second after I end the broadcast. Guys, hit the like button. Uh, I'm going to do a cast tomorrow, just kind of a, like a year end wrap up, just, you know, what all went down in uh, 2021. So I'll create the event um, later on this afternoon and schedule it in. So check that out for tomorrow. Thanks, Petey. Pleasure, Rich.